Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And I want to begin this morning by doing something I shouldn't do, and that is give you medical advice. I'm not a doctor, not even close. I have no medical training at all. I'm not certified to do any type of medical procedure or anything like that. So with all of that being said, let me give you some medical advice, right? So, <laughs> so did you know that if you get cut kind of bad and you think you need stitches, you don't need to go to the hospital if you have crazy glue. Now, see, here's how I discovered this. I'll let you know. So this is years and years ago. So this is, uh, my wife is pregnant. Heather's pregnant. She's on the soundboard today. So this could, this could get bad. She can, like, cut things out when she doesn't want to. <laughs> so, so she's pregnant with Sophie, our daughter. So this is almost 20 years ago. Hard to believe. And she is carving, I think it was a turkey, carving a turkey. And she had the big serrated, like, turkey knife, right? And she cut her finger, like down to the bone, like really, really bad cut. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't in the room, but, you know, the distress call was different. It wasn't like the I'm mad at you call, and it wasn't like, you know, it was just a different one. You're like, uh-oh, something's wrong. So I come running. Now, you know, I get on the scene, and then there's blood everywhere, down to the bone. It's nasty. And I got to be totally honest with you. The first thing that came to my mind, the first thing I thought was, I really don't want to go to the hospital. Right? So BC, that is before Christ, right? But if I'm telling you the truth, I probably would have thought the same thing today, right? You know, like, why can't you be more careful? We've got to go to the hospital now. So I was like, okay, now here's the thing. I may not be a doctor certified to do anything like that at all, but I see, I've seen a lot of people get hurt. I got hurt a lot, did martial arts in my past, if you know my story. So very accustomed to this type of thing happening. You get cuts all the time. So I was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to the hospital. You're going to elevate it. you got to elevate it because when you got blood going, tss, tss, you know, it's got to go above the heart, just a tip. Stay calm, right? So now here's the funny part. Run it under cold water, right? But the sink is here. Her heart is here. So I got to get her below. Now, I don't know. I cannot remember whether I got her a chair, pregnant woman, or I just said, kneel on the floor. Put your hand on the sink. <laughs> I, in going through this, I can't remember, so I didn't care. I was like, we're not going to the hospital. So there we go. So you rinse it out, right? Get some of the blood, it's a stop, you know, it's just kind of slowing down a little bit. We're, we're doing good. Clean it out. Don't use iodine because it singes, and then you're not going to get a nice, anyway, that's a good, mm -hmm, somebody knows. So anyway, so I clean it the best I can, and I get the crazy glue. And now it's about ready. So you put it together nice and careful, put a nice bead of crazy glue over it. Now, we're going to have show and tell. Afterwards, you can all annoy my wife and say, let me see. And you'll be able to look at the scar that's not there because I did an amazing job. Now, this was validated in a not so funny way, but excuse me if I make it funny, right? So later, like, I don't know, this is like four years later, five years later, we're at Disney World, right? So now my daughter's there with us. She's now born. And she's like running around doing what kids do at Disney World, right? But she forgets. At Disney World, they also have curbs. And you have to like, you know, step up or down off of it. She forgets that. Her focus is on everything else. And bam, falls right off the curb. And instead of, you know, like bracing, doing something, you know, anything, she breaks the fall with her face. That's what happens. Gets her chin. All right, so now when it happens, I told you I was going to laugh, so whatever, I'm a bad person. <laughs> so whatever. So I go run, and the first thing that came to my mind was not, was not, I don't want to go to the hospital. I didn't think that this time. You know what I thought? We're going to be rich, right? Because she fell at Disney, so <laughs> I didn't get any better, right? That's the first thing that comes to my mind. So, and then my wife's probably thinking like, oh no, her modeling career, right? Because she's falling on her face. And I'm like, modeling career? We don't need that for our financial future anymore. We're going to sue Disney, right? So, you know, I, was, I didn't start that. But anyway, <laughs> so she falls. And now I'm thinking, oh, crazy glue. Like, here's my chance, right? And I think it's her face, right? She did a good job on your wife's hand, but it's her face. Like, you can't do it. So I'm like, okay. So they whisk us out of there. Because back in the day, nothing bad ever happened at Disney. You can't. So we get whisked out of there. We get the back clock tour that we don't want. All right, so they take us to the hospital. I barely remember any of that. Take us to the hospital. We're waiting for the doctor a really long time. Finally, the doctor comes in. Examines everything. Takes, like, the temporary stuff off. And, you know, she's going to clean it up. 
And then she pulls out of her like little vest or whatever the thing that looks like crazy glue. And I was like, is that crazy glue? And she says, no. And for a moment, I was like, you know, my wife's like, thank goodness. Right? So, and she's like, but it's like crazy glue. And I'm like, oh, you see? And now my wife's like, oh, we're never going to hear the end of this story now. You know, I'm like, hey, look at my wife's hand. Do you see it? See what? Exactly. There's no scar there, right? So I never stopped talking about that. It's still told, the story. So that whole thing, this is where I'm going, made me think of a story about a little girl, like my daughter, whose father was trying to teach her how to be generous, like generosity. We're going to start high here. And so he gives her two dollars. And he says, listen, this dollar is for the Lord, and this one's for you. Right? So when you're going to save it, teaching her about like saving things and being responsible. And when we get to church, you're going to put it in the box. That's for the Lord. The other one, it's yours. My kids just start asking the questions, right? They automatically ask every detailed question, right? So, uh, so I, can I spend it on anything I want? Yes. Can I spend it on candy? Yes. Can I go to the store now and buy candy with you? Know, yes. So they're in a the safe neighborhood. The store is right down the road. So she goes out the door with the dollars. Now, you're on bikes, if you're a girl, if, well, anyway, I'm not going to go there. But on bikes, you know the streamers that you had on the handlebars? Does anyone, do they do that anymore? Is that a thing? I think they're responsible for a lot of accidents, right? The kid does not need any distractions, right? So that's what they do. They're like, woo! I'm going fast enough to look at my streamer, go, and then boom, you know, they get into an accident. So she's doing the same thing with the dollar. She's like, because kids do that kind of stuff. Like, they'll grab things and like, look at my money. And so she's running along, but her focus is entirely on the money now. Like she, and like my daughter, not on the curb, right? So boom, she falls down. But unlike my daughter, she puts her hand out. Now, that's not always a good idea because you can break your wrist, but better than your face, right? So she falls down, boom, hits the ground, the dollar, like in a cartoon, floats around and goes right into a storm drain. Well, the people see it, and they must be Christian because they're not like, oh, we don't want to go to the hospital, right? So they all rush over. <laughs> they pick her up, dust her off and everything. Are you okay? Go through the whole thing. She doesn't even have a skin knee. She's, she's good. She's, she's clear, right? So they get to the next thing. Oh, you know, we saw you lost your dollar. We're so sorry, but it went down the storm drain. It's, we're not going to be able to get your dollar. She says, that's Okay. They start thinking, that's a pretty good kid. They don't even care. She lost half her money. She lost a dollar. And she's like, no, that's okay. That was the Lord's dollar. <laughs> yeah. All right. So today, you guys are not going to get off the hook easy. We're going to talk about money. <laughs> so that, that was why it's like a nice long icebreaker. It's going to get rough in here this morning. So I've got to get you guys to laugh a little bit, but that'll go away. Anyway, so last week we talked about servant relationships. And so it intersected with this theme of sacrifice. We talked about sacrifice, giving up things for the sake of the kingdom, right? And so different people have to give up different things. It's not all the same. But we looked at the young rich man as he's billed uh, in the Gospels. And, well, we saw that his hang-up was the money, right? He needed to let go of it. He needed to get rid of that addiction, whatever it was to him, and follow Jesus. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to see this theme continue. If you're new here, the Bible's not in chronological order. So for example, we're in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And they give us the same story about Jesus's life and ministry, but different perspectives, right? So no contradictions, just different perspectives. Some add a little bit here. Oh yeah, you know, so maybe Matthew, you forgot that or whatever it is, right? So that's how it works. And I make you guys charts. So we're putting it in chronological-ish order. And we're going to hop around a lot more than we did last week. Uh, Matthew 20, Mark 10, yeah, we'll go to Mark 10, Luke. Uh, spend a lot of time in chapter 19. And then I'm going to hop over to John because we get some details in a little bit um, in Matthew. So we're going to hop right in to the scriptures. Matthew 20, 29. As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them, but they only shouted louder. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. When Jesus heard them, he stopped and called. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said, we want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes. Instantly, they could see, and they followed him. So we see here, faith, right? And then as a result of that change, we see gratitude. They follow Jesus. So now this gets a little bit confusing, and you see they're kind of like coming and going from Jericho. It's hard to figure out, like, 
where to put this chronologically. Uh, I check a bunch of sources and try to come up with a common denominator. Also, what's difficult is he's going to heal Bartimaeus, this blind guy. So you have a couple of options here, and it's important unless you're totally sure not to be so definitive. So what's happening here is either this next thing is the same event and just one guy being highlighted, like, oh, that was his name, by the way, because they both got healed, the same thing happened. Or it's a different event, he just does it twice. So that's probably what's going on here. They're just pointing out maybe this uh, same guy. So Bartimaeus, Mark 10, uh, starting at 46. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come over here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go. For your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Faith. Change. He follows Jesus. So now we'll see a little more change. We'll hop over to Luke 19.1. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, come, come down quick. <clears throat> I must be your guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He is going to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, <clears throat> Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So here we see this man exhibits great change. And it's really hard to hold back the jokes, right? He could have short-changed himself, right? <laughs> so I, I'm not going to keep going. Anyway, <laughs> so change, right? So maybe not the young rich ruler there giving away everything, but hap, paying back people four times as much. Exhibits change. Luke 19.11, the crowd was listening to everything Jesus said, and because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. He said, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then returned. Before he left, he called together 10 of his servants and divided among them 10 pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I'm gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what the profits were. The first servant, master, I invested your money made 10 times the amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You're a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted you with, so you'll be governor of 10 cities as a reward. The next servant says, I invested your money. I made five times the amount. Similar thing. I'll make you a governor of five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money to his master and said, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit the money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest. Then turning to the others, he says, take the money from that servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. And they say, well, he already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied. And to those who use well what they're given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. So a lot going on here, but trying to make it simple for you guys. So obviously Jesus is talking about himself, right? He is going to return. It tells us why. He tells the parable to correct the impression that the kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom is now. Jesus is coming back. So he's going to return. He's going to be killed, right? rise from the dead, ascend to heaven but he's coming back, so when the king returns. So you have to view the parable with this context in mind. 
It's really important because people use these and they go real sideways with them. <laughs> he told them the story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. So what this is all about is being good with whatever resources you have now for the kingdom later, right? When Jesus comes back and then you see he's rejected. Who was the king rejected by? His own people. And we know in the story, rejected by the Jewish people. So clearly that's what's going on here. But he's going to come back and judge them and it's going to be really serious. So that's the context. What you should not be thinking is, Jesus just told me how to make a lot of money. Right? <laughs> like, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, not now. Later, did you catch it? It's important. Not now. Later, right? Remember the rich man. Storing your treasure in heaven. We'll see that over and over and over again. So this is really abused quite a bit. And it may sound familiar. And it's better to also read in Matthew, Matthew 25. It's probably another time Jesus is telling his parable because it's a little bit different. You have three servants, but kind of the similar thing ends up happening. It's very, very much the same. But you need to think. You need to go back because it's one stream of words. Jesus is still talking to Matthew 24. And he talks about like the final judgment and all this stuff and about the slave and the master. It's about being ready, right? So that's the first parable he tells. You need to be ready for the king's return. It's kind of like this. Then the bridesmaids, right? Ten bridesmaids, five were smart. They gathered up the oil. They got to stay up late at night waiting for the bridegroom to come. Five not so smart. They don't buy the oil, right? He gets there while they're gone. I don't know you. What's that about? Oil management? No, <laughs> it's about being ready. That wasn't a trick question. It, it was about, you guys have obviously heard a lot of bad teachings, right? So it's not about oil management. It's about being ready for Jesus to come back. Then he tells this parable, so a different version of it. It's not about money management. It's no more about money management than it is about oil management for the bridesmaids. Yet people abuse it. And when you do this, like, it's real funny. Greed causes you to totally miss the point. Totally miss the point. It's about being totally ready. Jesus could come back at any moment. Well, how are you behaving yourself? What are you doing? He's not going to come back and say, did you save a lot of money? <laughs> I don't think so. He's not going to be worried about that, right? He's more likely to say, did you give all your money to the poor? You know, like, so it's not when people do this. And one thing just you guys got to listen for. If you have someone, and I'm just trying so hard not to say popular names right now, but if you have like these money management guru guys, guru of earthly wealth you know, guys, like using these scriptures, abusing these scriptures, right, to try to get people to think that they're going to be rich, and they don't mention Jesus once, stop listening. Stop listening. Don't listen to that person anymore. They're a false teacher. The whole point of all of this is Jesus. That's it. It's not about anything else. It's about him being our master, our waiting for his return, and us doing whatever he tells us to do with all this stuff that's all going to get melted if you read the Bible. It doesn't matter. Sorry, Earth Day people, but <laughs> it's going to be gone. <laughs> all our efforts are futile. Jesus is going to come back. <clears throat> everything gets destroyed. New heavens, new earth. Jesus is saying, that's eternal. Put your trust in that. That's the point. So, sometimes even the disciples, they get a little off. So, John 12.1, we'll hop over there. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, that's what Martha does. And Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Now, before we blame it all on Judas, let's go to Matthew. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. Plural. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you'll not always have me. If we go to Matthew, he continues, I tell you the truth. Whenever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. 
So this sounds familiar uh, to the worshiping woman, remember I talked about her, did like almost exactly the same thing. Most likely in this case, two different things, although again, they're not in chronological order. So if you get confused, yes, we went over this before. Worship, that is worship. The point, the disciples completely overlook this act of worship over what? Money. They're worried about the money. Last week, if you weren't here or you forgot, it's okay. The young rich ruler, he's just, Bill, that's what it says in bold before the story, right? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what are the commands, right? So he goes through like the back half of the Ten Commandments. Ah, I've done all those my whole life. Jesus loves him and tells him the truth. Well, here's the thing. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor, then you will have treasure where? In heaven. The guy went away sad. Why? The money stopped him from following Jesus. He couldn't change to follow Jesus. And Jesus was requiring that change. Now, in these scriptures, we'll see a contrast, right? <clears throat> Between those who had faith and those who experienced change be, uh, or couldn't experience the change, right? Because of the lack of faith. So, you see a fear of losing the money impacting these people. The blind men, they had the faith to be healed, right? Then they were grateful, gratitude and change. Zacchaeus, it's a pretty big deal. I'll give away half of everything I own. And if I've cheated anyone, tax collectors, that's why they called them sinners, were notorious for charging too much interest, and they shouldn't be doing that to their own people, the Jewish people. So they're sinners. That's what's going on here. I'll give back four times as much. That's a lot. So this could be like everything the guy has. He's willing to follow Jesus. Change. The servants, right? So that one, the wicked servant. Fear. I was afraid. Right? I might lose your money. Fear over money. The rich man. Last week, and even the disciples struggle with it. It's powerful. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. And yeah, if it's worth a year's wages... It's a lot. I don't know, they sell perfume that expensive at like Sephora or Hermes, right? <laughs> Probably. So you'd expect the disciples to get it, right? But their concern is solely about the money, even in light of worship. This is a, a magnificent thing they're seeing here. It's beautiful. What about the money, Jesus? And we know about Judas. John tells us he's stealing the money. Also, he betrays Jesus, spoiler alert, for money. He betrays the Lord for money. What a powerful effect it can have on our thinking, on our faith. It's unbelievable. And our ability to change, which requires that faith. And we've talked about it in the past, like <laughs> Colossians says it. We'll read it in a little bit. In a little bit. But it says a greedy person, someone who's loving money, is an idolater. Worshiping the things of this world. It's kind of crazy. If we worship money, we cannot change. Matthew from the Sermon on the Mount, 624, no one can serve two masters. For you will either hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Look at that word there. So it's a pretty good translation. Enslaved. That's important. Remember that. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer. <clears throat> if you're new here and you haven't been listening to me, um, or you haven't been listening to me, we see people, even in the Gospels, the women, they were what? Support, they're benefactors. They're supporting Jesus' ministry. You can't do that if you don't have money. Kind of important. We'll see that Paul, Lydia, hey, come stay at my house, supports Paul. Phoebe in Romans 16, benefactor for Paul. Philemon had to have money, and we talked about slavery last week, so you can go back and watch it for the context. I'm not going to do that right now, but he owns a slave. He owns Onesimus. Got to have money to do that. So we see people supporting the church, and we're going to see Paul instructs Timothy what to do with the rich people in the church. What do I tell them? He doesn't say give away all the money. It's not exactly for everyone. It's not maybe the ministry you've been called to. It might not be your thing, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So it's not mutually exclusive here. So as Christians, we can have money, but are we being good stewards of it for what? The kingdom. Are we enslaved to it? That's the question. <clears throat> the problem is when you're placing your faith in money. 
That's the problem. Our faith should not be there. And so many people do. A big one is, <laughs> so, you know, if I just had money, it would solve all my problems. Try being a pastor in Naples. <laughs> I will tell you, it does not. I have not yet seen one instance of anyone coming in and being like, hey, pastor, I never need to meet with you because I'm rich. And that just, that's it. I don't have any problems because of that. Right. And I've told people this. And then you get on the other side of things in Naples. It's a crazy, crazy city to be a pastor in because it's like Corinth or something, you know. I drive down the neighborhood and I see a woman pushing her kids to 7-Eleven in a shopping cart. And then there's a Maserati in the next driveway. I'm like, this is a crazy place, right? And so they hate on one another. That's what's always going on here. So I'll tell both of you, stop it. Like, right? You know, because this is another thing people say. Well, she doesn't have any problems because she has money. Really? You know, so that would solve all your problems. All of a sudden, you've got a bunch of money. And they think that. They're like, yeah. I'm like, you have Jesus, you crazy person. <laughs> like, you don't need money. Why aren't you excited about it? And why do you have that? I mean, it's, it drives me nuts, right? So just the thing. Money will solve all my problems. You mean not God? But that's what happens. They make the money God. And that's why a greedy person, someone who worships the money, they're an idolater. So I want to hop back to Luke 12. We did this a while ago. I, I often tell this kind of parable. Um, it's good on the subject. So what happens here in this context is a man approaches Jesus, and he wants him to settle a dispute. The guy's greedy. He wants to settle a dispute between him and his brother about, like, their father's inheritance. Right? So Jesus is like, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And then he says something real important. Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And so he tells a story, I'll paraphrase. Basically, it's this man who has fertile fields and lots of crops and things. And he's like, whoa! He basically has run out of room in his barns to store all this obviously extra stuff. What will I do? I know what I'll do. I'll tear down the barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll have everything I need. And I can sit back and say, we're all set. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night then who will get everything you worked for? Jesus is speaking in this. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. Keep reading. Again, Jesus starts talking about needs. Remember we talked about wants and needs. Pay attention. He starts talking, and I'll just read this to you because I want you to just focus. Then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Now, a little note here. This is very similar to some of the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. A good teacher is going to repeat on topics that are really important. So he does that. Notice this. Now, people will throw the don't worry. Don't worry about anything. Jesus says, don't worry about anything. We talked about, like, fear in the Bible, right? Don't worry about anything. But pay attention. The context of the don't worry statements are money. He just told that parable about the guy in the barns, the fool. Who was the fool? The guy that was worried about all the stuff. And then he starts telling these parables, all right? Continues, the flowers, look at the lilies. So he's like doubling, tripling down on this. And how they grow, they don't work or make their clothing. It's Solomon in all his glory, like the richest person in the Bible, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he'll certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Note. How this correlates, Jesus correlates this problem with a lack of faith. Why do you have so little faith? You can't have two masters, he said. And don't be concerned, he continues, about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. You guys picking this up? So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Not everything you want. Sell your possessions. This is Jesus still talking. Luke 12. And give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you. Where? In heaven. 
And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Seek the kingdom of God, and he'll give you everything you need. Give to those in need, and your treasure will be in heaven like the rich man. This gives your father great pleasure to give you what? Everything you want? No. The kingdom. But still, we often seek security here. Despite, I mean, this is repetitive. And this isn't the only place it is. Now, with all that being said, <laughs> I'm going to throw myself under the bus. So, you know, if you've heard parts of my story, it's important to do that. You know, it's like, look, the pastor has had his struggles and still has his struggles, okay? So I'm not like trying to, well, that may be the way it feels. Jesus is doing that. I'm reading the scriptures to you on purpose. It's not Pastor Gene saying it. It's Jesus. It's important. It's more important than anything I can say. But often our test becomes our testimony. Our mess becomes our message. So I like to share a little bit with you, right? So struggle, like with the being selfish about the hospital, right? So, <laughs> right? So been there. But my wife has told her story. If you've heard it, you know what her thing was. My thing was not that, right? So I, you know, I can have a drink and then walk away from it, whatever. That's not my thing. My thing was money. That was my, I had a money addiction, right? And so all these things have like a root, and I'll just very quickly condense my story here to tell you that when I was a kid, I had dyslexia. I'll just call it that for short. It's basically dyslexia. And they had a hard time diagnosing it. I went to a lot of doctors. But it meant that I was never going to be good in school. Never. It was, it was impossible. And my dad, my mom was more patient. But my dad, not patient with it. Not patient. He was an angry person. He was a violent person. And he called me lazy and stupid. That's what I am. I'm lazy. And I'm stu I heard that so much. You're skinny. You're lazy and stupid. And I, that was it. I heard it constantly. Right? So that's just it. That's the psyche through my whole life, right? And so if you know me, I did martial arts my whole life, but I also was a musician. And my whole family was, were musicians. It's like no big deal to be a musician. You could be amazing and like they don't care. They're like, you got to practice more. So just my whole life was music. And so, well, you know, how do you make money in music? Well, you know, you, you can't get into a good college, right, where there's music and do that kind of music, classical, so I'm going to do rock and roll, right? So I discovered that, and I got in rock bands, and they were good. They were good bands. We were very popular. Uh, we did well, but I learned very quickly that even if you do well, if you're not the top 0.5%, you're making no money. You live in a van. You just live on drugs. Then I had a friend, like, we get tattoos with cigarette money and hope for the best. Like, that's how we live, and that's not too far off, right? And then there's tons of drugs, and now alcohol and all kinds of bad stuff. So eventually, I kind of got to say, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to die. Like, this is really bad. So I went back to martial arts to be healthy, and there was an opportunity for me to open, you know, what we call the martial arts gym. It's not as formal as a dojo, and I was right on the cusp of, like, the ultimate fighting championship stuff. Like, I met the Gracies or the family that, like, uh, started the whole thing. And so I was in the right place at the right time. I published all kinds of stuff on the internet. We owned Jiu-Jitsu Net. Our schools blew up, and all of a sudden, like, overnight, we went from sleeping on the mats or her college dorm, and she's working several jobs to pay her way through college. We're out on our own. We were both out on our own, my wife and I, since like teenage years. Uh, just poverty, but like, boom, all of a sudden, like, you know, there's a Mercedes in the driveway, and there's a driveway, you know, so it's just crazy. You know, it just, it was a crazy, crazy flip. And when I got there, I was like, I am never going to be poor again. Never. And I ran for it. And every insecurity came right along with me. Right? So I don't have a Harvard ring, but, you know, whatever. But I have this $30,000 watch. You know, it was just insanity. I would be driving out the Benz dealership. And, like, before I got onto the road, I'm looking at the next Benz I'm going to buy. There was no stopping it. You couldn't dump enough money into that God hole. It was just unbelievable. Just money, 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 money. I'm, I make more money than the valedictorian in my high school. You know, just totally insecure. But then, it, I was measuring my value as a human being and other people's values by how much, that's how, you're as smart as you are, the money you made. And I really believed that. I bought into it all the way, pun intended. It was terrible. My whole value was in that. Everything. It meant everything to me. So I get it. <laughs> like, I totally understand. I put my faith in it. We moved, I was able to retire in my mid-30s. We moved down here to Naples. We didn't have to wait till we're like 70. Mid-30s. I retired. 
passive income coming and everything was great. I'm in paradise. Paradise. Open more businesses. It was crazy. Making all kinds of money. I can live in Naples. Now, we weren't rich, right? So, because otherwise I wouldn't have like tried to think I could get rich off Disney, but compared to Naples, you come here to Naples, you think you're rich up north, and you come here and you're like, oh, <laughs> right? So that's what started to trigger, though. It was actually a good thing, because wait a minute. What value does this really have? Like, what's this all about? And it started to kind of question things. And one of the first things I said before coming to this church, because we came as members uh, first, is before I came here, I was like, I need faith. I realized it. I'm like, I have really placed my faith in the wrong thing. This is no good. I need faith. And then what happened was, is over the course of time, and this was my hang-up, I got called into ministry. And the first thing I said, like, they, they started real slow. They're like, we kind of think, you know, you belong in ministry, not the business world. And I'm like, <laughs> the first thing I said to my pastor is like, you're stupid. <laughs> so I actually said that to him. You're dumb for taking this. This is the worst job in the world. Like, you're stupid, right? So, <laughs> so you know, he was very, very patient with me. He didn't say anything back. Um, so, you know, and, but, you know, it just, tons of things happened. We don't have time. So <clears throat> I got called into ministry. And the first thing, the second thing was, like, I don't want to be that poor. Like, I want to make a lot of money. I have goals, right? I have dreams. Like, I have things I want to do. And they're like, uh, you know, you don't, you don't get it at all. And I didn't initially. I was very disobedient, very disobedient in the beginning. I did not listen. I was like, nope, uh-uh. But God put me in the hospital, right? So he gave me some time out to think about it. And then I changed, right? So I need to be I was kicking against the goads, as they say. I need to be prodded a little bit harder. I changed. But here's the thing, and I'll say this to you, right? So it's not about me, but so you understand where I'm coming from. That's where, this is where I belong. Never in my life, never in my life have I, I reached a point where I've, like, just been content. Like, content's like an evil word to say in our culture. Like, I'm just content. I don't I'm really, you know, I don't know. If you ask me, like, what do I want? I'm like, I want... A better pizza oven. <laughs> Everyone who knows me is like, okay, we get the point. <laughs> When's your birthday? <laughs> so no one ever said that to me. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> but anyway, right? But if I can make good pizza, like, I'm good, right? Like, they really don't want for much. I'm good with my old truck. I saved it. God allowed me to keep some things. I'm okay. I don't need a bigger house. I don't, I just like doing this. I like reading God's word, hanging out with people, talking about food, right? I'm content. But you see the lesson? You see the lesson? Like, I had a lot. Like, compared to normal people, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I had, like, all the nicest things. Amazing. And I was not happy. It was just a hamster wheel, right? Because you put your faith in something, nothing, it's material, that's what happens. You just do that. And you never reach that point. Have you ever asked yourself, if you're not, some people are, congratulations. But if you're content, right? But if you're not, have you ever just asked yourself, like, what? Where am I going to, when is the time going to come when I am? I'll give you a good answer. If you're not putting it in Jesus, if it's anywhere else, when you die. <laughs> that's it. You're going to be on that hamster wheel forever. It's never going to be good enough. And like Naples, the lesson you should be learning, all right? You're going to pull up in a Ferrari, the guy in the, like, limited edition McLaren is going to pull up next to you and be like, I got one of those in the trunk, buddy. You know what I mean? You, 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 good luck. Good luck keeping up with the Joneses, especially here. Like, I'm laughing at you. I'm watching you try and go, oh, my gosh. You know? Right? With the Mercedes. I have a C class. Now I have an E class. Now I have an S class. It just never ends. And then you go to the next brand. Stop it. Stop. You want to find contentment? It's in Christ. That's it. It's the only place it is. That's it. And it can keep us from certain things, like it did me. I'm teaching you a lesson. Not everyone's called into ministry, all right? So just, you know, like the disclaimer. Not everyone's called into that level. I have to be an example to everybody, so I can't be like having so much money. Right? That's just my thing. You know, maybe people, my wife was called into the business world. She stayed there, right? And as a result, great benefactor to the church. We get her time, talents, and her treasures. Thanks. She gets like, you know, these bonuses. I'm like, did you tithe it? You know, <laughs> so it's funny. <laughs> but that's okay. We need Phoebe's. We need those. 
I'm not talking about the one in Friends. I'm talking about the one in the Bible. We, <laughs> we need those, right? We need, the church needs benefactors. None of this happens. And if you're new here, go upstairs. Look at what we do. We have recovery meetings here. We feed those in need. We do all kinds of things. That's not free. It's not free. So we need your help if you have the funds to help us. That being said, right, so not everyone's equally the same, but it's, it's so, it has so much gravity that it's mentioned so much in the Bible, right? So just to encourage you, just before I, I go into the last couple of scriptures here and try to close, just <laughs> Satan loves it. He just must love it right? because it can totally, if we put our focus on the money, what? We can stumble. See, that was the whole now you get it, right? We can't be focused on the money. And we miss out, and this is the thing. This is where the devil has to be laughing. Because when we do that, we shortchange ourselves. We actually miss out on the bigger blessing. Why are you getting all the stuff that you want to get? Because you want to be content. <laughs> and you never will be. The secret is letting go of it. <laughs> That's the secret, or not being so attached to it. And it's such a big deal. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. So I'll give you the context. First Timothy, if you don't know anything about the Bible, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, I put Philemon in there. Pastoral epistles, right? What does that mean? Basically, Paul is giving instructions to those who are running the churches, right? So that's Timothy, Ephesus, Titus, Crete. So that's what's going on here. That's your context. And he's giving instructions. Funny enough, he talks about slaves being obedient to their masters. He talks about false teachings, and I'm just going to read this to you, and then I'll, we'll put it on the screen. Teach these things, Timothy. Encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these things are wholesome, the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words and stirs up arguments. And in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions, these people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt, and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Now, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Yet true godliness with contentment itself is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be there it is again. Content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Been there. For the love of money is the root of all evil, it says in the Greek. Yeah, our culture's kind of crept into the translations, not all kinds. Greek says all. The best translation is the original. And some people, craving money, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows or many pains. Not only can money cause us <laughs> just to like, take us away from the faith, but it can cause us to stumble. Again, there are rich people in the church, so I want you to pay attention to this. This is what Paul instructs Timothy to tell him. 1 Timothy 6.17, teach those who are rich in this world. He doesn't say, no, get out of the church, right? No, in this world... But not to be proud. Not to be proud and not to trust in their money. Don't show it off, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future, not here, so that they may experience true life. Sound familiar? Bible's talking about it again, over and over and over again. Do not be proud of your money. Don't trust in it. Be generous. So we come to the scripture, we must ask ourselves, what is our faith really in? Where? Are we storing our true treasure? Are we making a good investment in something eternal or a poor investment in something that he says, Jesus says, moths can eat and rust destroys? Is the kingdom of God enough? Are we making ourselves our own kingdom? Is that what we're building here? Who do we serve and what do we worship? I mentioned Colossians earlier, so I want to kind of close on this. 
Colossians 3.1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. He's talking about Jesus coming back. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, or evil desires. It's not the only one. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Again, <clears throat> some encouragement for you guys as I close up here. Shared with you my story, but I'll tell you one thing. I told you about contentment, right? It's a real thing. You can be content with your stuff. Do I worry? Yes. Do I have concerns about money? Yes. But, you know, if you know what your things are, like, I put boundaries in place, like someone with you know, a drug addiction might have or something like that. Same thing. I don't obsess over money. Heather pays the bills. The church, same thing. They just pay all the... I don't even know. I have no idea how much we're making. Like, no clue. Don't worry about that. I'm fine. But I used to obsess over it. I cannot tell you how much. I checked the bank account, checked the bank account, checked the bank account. Like it was unbelievable. I realized like how crazy I was in that. But here's the thing. I want to just encourage. I want to leave you with some encouragement because it sounds like a lot for a lot of people. I get it. Like that's kind of our thing. <sighs> it's crazy. I can honestly testify before you today. Like there were times on, and I'm like, you know, paper got very structured. On paper, like, there was no way I can live off of this. Like, there's no way. Like, I, what? Like, God, are you really calling me into this? <laughs> like, it didn't make sense on paper, but our God is not a paper God. There wasn't one month where I missed any payments on anything. I always had not only everything I needed, I didn't ever stop going on vacations. <laughs> it was just the money was there. The money was there. <laughs> and I had everything I and some and always more. But the secret, it took me years to figure out, it was just letting it go. Not having any faith in it, not caring. Like, whatever. God's got it. If he wants me to have that, I'll have it. If he doesn't, I won't. And that's just fine. And so you can get there if you're not. If you are there, amen. Praise God. It's amazing because if you are still in that cycle, you are enslaved. You are not a free person. It's an illusion. I'm free to spend. No, 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 no. It's making you more of a slave. It's not freeing you. And man, getting rid of those shackles is life-changing. It's so freeing. And you'll feel it. You actually feel like a weight has come off of you. So if you want to experience that, come talk to me. I'll be hanging out. We'll talk about food, too. But you, <laughs> you can talk, talk about Jesus for an hour. But you know, we can continue talking about that. Right? You want to meet with me? That's totally cool. There are other people here to meet with, too. We love you. Right? We care about you. We want to see you have true freedom in Jesus Christ and experience that. Amen? Let me pray for you. Lord. And thank you for everyone who came in today. I pray for everyone who could not be here today. Hopefully they'll watch the message. And I just ask that you let, most importantly, not my words, but your word permeate into their hearts. And I pray that we see change and freedom in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you. Please bless us as we go out so that we can be a blessing to all we encounter, all for the sake of the kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name.